part of the America Future series, and uh, I'm honored to be here with Marie Falkowski for Modi and I. My name is John Side. I'm a partner and national security segment leader at GuideHouse. Um, we do government and commercial technology and management consulting. So, Marie, first of all, thank you for joining me. This is great to have this dialogue. Um, why don't we start by just going through your background? I know you have a very extensive background in national security, a lot of passion that's come from years and years of service. Maybe talk about how you came upon this journey to where you are today. Yeah, sure, John. And thank you so much for having me. This is uh, quite an honor. Thank you. Um, I'll start with my passion for national security, which is deeply rooted in my family. I come from a long line of people who have served our country as far back as the American Revolution. Everything from enlisted to officers, scouts and spies, um, to those who enabled supply lines and worked in early in state and federal government roles. So there are strong relationships in my family to our country's founding fathers. So for me, the goals of democracy are inherently personal. Um, as far as my leadership journey, it began when I enlisted in the Air Force in 1990 as an intelligence specialist. And within weeks of training, Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. So I found my 19-year-old self giving current intelligence briefings to very senior officers, just kind of thrown into the deep end of the pool for a real-world situation. And uh, during my military career, I served both on active duty as well as a civilian. And I'm a veteran of Desert Storm, Desert Shield. I served in the Combined Air Operations Center at Angelic, Turkey uh, during Operation Northern Watch. And so much of my experience naturally has a counterterrorism slant. And all of it is what we would call kind of joint positions, where I worked closely with big intel community agencies, which was a little unusual. Um, I've also spent a few years at the Department of Energy, where I got a very interesting view of working in a cabinet level organization and with the national labs. Um, in that, those roles, I served as the deputy director for counterterrorism, and later as the Director of Operations in the Office of Counter of Intelligence and Counterintelligence. So it was about, uh, I want to say 2010, when I went to the CIA as a senior analyst and later led their Middle East and terrorism efforts for open source intelligence and eventually became their first CTO for the CIA-led open source enterprise. And that's really where I cut my teeth in the technology space. And more recently, as the Director for AI, and data analytics within the CIA's agency data office. So in my current role, I work for the intelligence community's chief data officer as the executive lead for IC mission analytics and technology acceleration. And because I have such deep and varying experiences, I think it's made me a better advocate for using tech for mission while understanding the urgency that we face in today's very hyper-connected, digitally transforming world. Marie, that's fascinating. And I mean, first of all, thank you for your service and your continued service and just the, the very depth of experience and expertise that you had that you're bringing to the mission today. Um, clearly, you have a passion that spans your entire career and even growing up. And one of the things we often say is the folks that are most effective in supporting our government counterparts are those that love the mission first and want to tackle those problems. And, and clearly, you're one of those people as well, which is just so great to see. Now, you talked about technology advancement and the role it's played over the past 15 years. How has that changed from you being in the battlefield all the way to the roles that you play today? How are you seeing that transformation occur? And, and are, we, are we getting there fast enough? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, there is a great deal, I think, to be said about the democratization of technology and with the development and how ubiquitous the use of mobile devices, um, the advancement of cloud computing, and the increased global access to the internet for people, for businesses, and for governments. Everyone has incredible access these days to data information that they didn't have maybe 5, 10, 15 years ago. And I can remember a time in the mid-90s when my fellow airmen and I were first introduced to a Microsoft user interface. Um, so that we could sift through intelligence messages. And it was such a game changer. So prior to that, um, we would it would, could take me a full day to read maybe a thousand intelligence messages and a week to write a product. So now we have the ability to automate alerting and indications and warning. 
We can use natural language processing to summarize large sets of documents, um, derive intelligence insights from near real-time streaming data, and use things like computer vision to automate image classification and object detection in photos and videos. So when you think of technologies like, say, AI, in one decade, this technology has gone from what I think is funny, finding cats in online videos, to enabling a string of text to create artistic renditions of any image in any situation. And so this evolution has taken us from large-scale object detection and image classification to generative AI within a decade. Um, but I would also say that this democratization of technology is also a challenge for national security. We can take misinformation and the ability for things like deep fakes to be so realistic mm -hmm. that they can challenge even a trained professional. And these tools that generate misinformation are increasingly available. So it's not just somebody with advanced tech skills that could use them, but anybody with a computer or a smart device. And another example I would give is commercial drone technology and its increased use on the battlefield. You can consider that non-state actors and terrorist groups and insurgents typically had little to no access to military air power. They didn't have the money, they didn't have the skills for such capabilities. But now, these drones can be flown autonomously at a fraction of the cost, with no casualties. We saw this back in Iraq in uh, 2016. We see it today in the Ukraine, where Ukrainian forces have been able to use commercial drones to destroy Russian tanks. So, you know, the price of a commercial drone and some explosives, about $1,000 at a pop, uh, and taking out a tank, which costs hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to build and maintain. So there are kind of two sides uh, to that uh, democratization coin. That's exactly what I was thinking. I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? It, the barrier to entry, unfortunately, for those seeking to do harm to us and our allies is much lower because the technology is more ubiquitous whether that's the way they analyze data and to your point, you know, leverage misinformation or just use technology in rudimentary ways or ways that it wasn't even developed for to inflict, you know, damage and harm. So, yeah, it is a fascinating challenge. So I think this next question sort of plays a little bit more on, are we doing enough as a nation from a government perspective, from the private sector, the defense industrial base? There are lots of organizations out there like America's Futures and Benz and others that are working hard side by side with our government counterparts to make these things happen. But do we have the right infrastructures in place to think through policy changes at the rapid pace of technological change or the way we sort of procure services or products and, and others? Maybe just your thoughts on, on where that stands and where we can do better collectively as a, as a country. Yeah, this is such a great question. And it's a big topic here at the ODNI. Um, I would say in a recent interview, Director Haynes had indicated that we had to do more than just you know, improve relationships, but we have to change our philosophy and our approach. So in one example, we have to stop viewing the private sector as just vendors, uh, but an extension of the national security mission. So one way we've started to tackle this issue is that our office has launched what we call the Future Now series of events, where we're bringing partners from the private sector and academia together with IC leaders, which includes the DOD, as well as several law enforcement agencies. So we can talk about common challenges and how we drive solutions. And our most recent event was actually just this week, uh, where we held the IC's first ever data and AI summit. This is the first time that we brought together the IC's, what we call the digital C-suite, or our preeminent senior technology executives that are responsible for enabling the missions of each IC organization and private sector. And the theme of the summit was AI readiness by 2025. So this was a Chatham House Rules invitation only event that was designed to allow the participants to feel very comfortable and engage in open dialogue. So can't really get too much in the details, but I will sure. say that we learned a great deal. We're going to use some of the themes and some of the recommendations in our upcoming strategic planning efforts. But we have to do more of those things where we just feel comfortable uh, talking to one another. And we're also very closely partnered with the Department of Defense and how they're implementing CJADC2 to drive a more data-centric approach to technology. But the bottom line here is that we have to recognize that we all have something 
in common. And that very thing we have in common is data. And the more that we view data as a national security asset and not just think about it from the, the point of fact of where it, sits in, where it sits in the system that it's housed in, we start to peel away some of the myths and the dependencies that have inhibited closer collaboration in the past. Yeah, very well said. And I think, you know, obviously there's been tremendous advances in collaboration in the years since 9-11 across yeah. the federal entities and how they engage and think of the private sector. And, you know, there's clearly a continued need to evolve those relationships and collaboration. So you yeah. talk about AI, everybody talks about AI all the time. Um, and if you think about it, both from an internal organizational perspective and sort of an external mission tool, can you comment where you see that landscape changing over the next 10 years? And, you know, obviously keep it high level, but just sort of, you know, give everybody a preview of how we're thinking about that. Yeah, well, in my opinion, data and AI will be just as ubiquitous as your smartphone. It's going to drive all aspects of decision making, all the way from strategy to operations. And the technology that we're seeing today is going to change how we work, how we play how we fight, and how we live. And it will do things like power, gamified, and immersive approaches to operations planning, medical readiness, you name it. Uh, but one of the things that is kind of a, a choke point for me is to date, we still use the term innovation to mean introducing something new or cool to the workforce. But really, at least in government, we're still in the novel phase of using AI for intelligence and military operations. So for me, innovation is taking those cool new things and changing the way we operate. And in order for our data and AI to be used by war fighters, law enforcement, intelligence officers, diplomats, policymakers, in order for them to use that more holistically, we're going to have to consider the guidance and the standards that have to be in place to advance adoption. And I always like to give the example of electricity, which is so essential in modern life that many of us have no idea what it's like to live without it. But it wasn't until there were standards uh, that were accepted, AC versus DC, that made electricity less expensive. You could distribute it and create the means to power uh, large areas, and that's when electricity became an innovation and changed how the world lives. And I just think about uh, AI and the use of data in that lens. Yeah, and, and I'd like to pick up on that theme a little bit because I, I completely agree with your perspective. I think we should be looking at AI not as something to replace what we do, but rather to be a tool in what we do to be more efficient or effective at it. And I think right now, a lot of the dialogue quickly goes to AI will do this and we, we, the people won't do this anymore. And I don't think that that's the right discussion is how can, how can it enable us like so many technologies and advances to do what we do better, to focus on the things that you need humans to, to drive and, and make those sort of analytical decisions or those subjective decisions, um, leveraging technology. And, and I'm very excited to see how that's playing out, not only across government, but also industry as well. I think it's given us all a lot to think about, about how we design and structure our organizations, how we train people to leverage these kind of technologies, and then how we think about deploying them. And as you said, that all sort of new sets of rules and ideas come forward, government, governance, policy, uh, usage, rights, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm glad to hear you comment on that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of your current role as the, the ICCDO and and what you view first as the biggest opportunity, you know, in terms of leveraging the data that we currently have going forward. And obviously, there's no opportunity question that doesn't come with a challenge. So be ready for that one, Marie. No, that's great. Yeah, no, that's fine. And I, I work for the ICCDO, uh, Lori Wade, and it's just been a fantastic opportunity. I've been in my position now for about nine months. And um, I think, you know, my experiences uh, in the past have really kind of made me ready for these roles. Uh, from my perspective, I would say the biggest opportunity I see is there is a realization across the intelligence community and the DOD that the IC is a data organization. So really, no matter the discipline, the byproduct is always data, and it has to be shared, and it has to be analyzed across our community with our partners uh, in order for the U.S. to really maintain global leadership. 
And with the launch of the IC data strategy last year, we are all driving how the IC will innovate to discover, access, manage, share, and analyze the collective data holdings that we have. This starts with end-to-end data management which kind of can be a little bit, you know, passe for some, but it's really critical. We should know why and how and with whom we must share our data as we make collections decisions. And this really gets to trustworthy technology. All intelligence professionals and decision makers at every level require an assurance that the data is available in the right quality and quantity to train AI and machine learning algorithms responsibly and ethically whether they're collected by our officers and platforms, or if they're commercially acquired. So we have access to, like today, the power of multiple cloud service providers. We're also focused on building a strong and agile digital foundation with the compute resources and the infrastructure that is securely available to access this high quality data at scale so that we have the necessary automation and tools that work at the speed of mission, And this is a mission where timeliness of decisions increasingly must be made at fractions of a second rather than months or weeks. So I would say when it comes to challenges, the biggest challenge, as always, is culture. We have the technology available to us. We have strong cultures. uh, We have strong microcultures well-established processes across and with our, within our organizations. And I would say we have experienced some remarkable successes in the past few years, but we have to find ways to make those gains more fluid across organizations. So working to break down cultural barriers and enable processes that focus on secure data sharing is really going to be the truest test of our success over the coming months and years. Yeah, and I, it's great to hear you say that. You talk about culture. The other thing that always comes to mind in, in thinking about change and in initiatives is sort of workforce transformation or, or the workforce availability. And yes. how do you see that? Are, are enough people joining you know, the profession to be in government, to be in the IC, to hold those highest levels of clearances that have the skill sets that you know, the, the job requires today? And are people that are currently supporting getting upskilled to be able to do this. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing? Is that transformation occurring? And is it occurring at a a rate that you think is going to keep up with the change in the way we do things? No, I think that's an issue. um, And it's a great question. I think that's an issue that we see across all established organizations that have varying degrees of experience and, um, and working through their digital journey. Uh, the intelligence community, like any established organization, is going through that digital journey. And part of that is working with the workforce so that you're bringing in the right talent, um, that you're upskilling your workforce so that they have more digital literacy, and uh, you're able to maintain a high-quality workforce. I think what we're going to have to do over time is take advantage of more of these private partner um, partnerships, public-private partnerships, where we can have an exchange of individuals coming in and out of public and private sector uh, institutions so that we can share information. But also, uh, we probably will have to manage our expectations, too, that individuals won't be serving uh, 20, 30 years in one organization. You know, this generation that's coming into the workforce, they are digital natives, they are used to working technology, and they're going to be interested in moving around, getting different opportunities, and seeing different things from uh, multiple vantage points. So it's not going to be uh, the way that people look at their careers and how they stay in government is not going to look the same as it did when I had joined the Air Force back in 1990. You're, you're so right. And in fact, it's not unique to government. I think it's just across, we see that in private, the private sector all the time as well. And I fully mm. support that we have to find structures and models to allow people to sort of fill, fulfill their passions and support the missions they care about, kind of lower the barriers to the greatest extent possible. So we're getting that information sharing more organically. Um, we have an audience today that is comprised of senior government uh, executives and senior executives from the private sector. 
if you were to sort of reach out and ask them how they could best support and help these missions and the work that you and your colleagues do, what are some of the things you'd love to see, you know, as a, as a community that cares so deeply about national security? I think the number one thing that I would like to see from the folks in this audience is, you know, come in with an open mind. Uh, again, we're an organization, we have some very established workflows and processes, and we do have a culture that is really focused around secrecy and maintaining national secrets. So it's very important for us to establish trust with other organizations that we partner with, make sure that we know that they understand what we're asking for, and also sometimes help us understand what we're asking for. We don't always know. We spend a lot of time uh, behind what I call an artificial firewall and, you know, working out a, a daily grind uh, during world events that can often be chaotic and we don't have a lot of time to produce whatever information that needs to go downtown, uh, needs to go to the president, needs to go to that war fighter. So it's going to be a lot of trust uh, that is going in and, you know, feeling less like something's being sold to us. Perfect. Well, Marie, first of all, thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to, to sit with me yeah. and, and answer some questions. I really appreciate your perspectives. Um, Marie Falkowski, the Senior Director of ODNI, um, so grateful and, uh, and thank you uh, again for your service. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, John. 